Hi, I'm David Stringer, and this is R2000, the uh, Better Built House. Well, that's the name of the show. It's not necessarily the case with this house. We've been looking at the importance of mechanical ventilation in new homes and what the basic requirements of those systems are. And homes with mechanical ventilation are becoming increasingly more popular with the public, and builders are responding to that demand. The guy who built this joint got one thing right anyway. The system's certainly supplying lots of fresh air. Oliver Drerup is our resident expert in the design and construction of all phases of energy efficient housing. I think it's about time to pop down to his office. Hi, Oliver. Hi, I understand that you're going to help us with the details of the design and installation of house ventilation system. And as I've seen, things can go wrong. You're right, they can. But before we get into the fundamentals of how you go about sizing these systems, I think we ought to have a brief review. Okay. The ventilation system in the better built house must provide the homeowner with good air quality while meeting the homeowner's comfort requirements in a manner that is both efficient and economical. That means that the system must control and remove excessive buildup of pollutants, odors, and humidity. Good air distribution is an important feature. The ventilation system must be capable of supplying fresh air to all of the living areas of the house. Finally, the effective ventilation system will provide balanced air flows by supplying and exhausting the same volume of air. David, a good ventilation system requires both a good design and good installation practices. Well, can we have a closer look at the design of the mechanical ventilation system that goes into the better built house? Um, I'm interested in what went wrong in that one I visited earlier. You bet. But let's begin with the fundamentals on which that design is based. In this particular building that we're looking at, we're trying to figure out how we're going to be putting this ventilation system in. And there are three issues at stake here. One of which is how big it's going to be, the sizing of the entire system. The second issue is how we're going to distribute the air through the building. And the third issue is how we're going to control that so that the homeowner is going to be able to turn the system on and off. Well, I guess the first thing is first, isn't it? The sizing. You have to decide how big a unit to get. Exactly. We'll go up there and check it on the board. The sizing is determined by a variety of rules of thumb and requirements that are established by, obviously, the National Building Code, by ASHRAE, and by the R2000 requirements. And they, all all of, they all agree, I hope. They all agree. <laughs> what we need is 10 CFM, cubic feet per minute of air, per finished room in the building in order to get the sizing of the system. So we have, in this particular case, we're looking at eight rooms. 10 times eight is? 80. Oh, good. I'm glad I got that right. Does it get any more complicated? You'll be tested on Thursday. We also have an additional requirement for basements and utility rooms, if the house contains those. And that is 20 CFM per. And in this particular case, we have one basement and one utility room. Two times 20 is? Uh, 40, but I got distracted because the utility room will have more humidity, but uh, why does the basement get more exhaust? Well, it's or not supply. so much that those areas obtain or get this particular supply, is what we're talking about in the sizing of the system, but rather that they're going to be used as part of the living space or the entire shell of the building for calculating the total amount that's required because what we're looking for down here is the design capacity of the system. Okay. Now let's add 40 and 80 together for fun. Oh, it is getting tougher. 120. Right. So there's 120. Now because we want to make sure that at continuous operation we are going to be dealing with 120 cubic feet per minute of air which will carry this house and because in the control strategy we are going to want to be able to kick that up to a higher speed we're going to add 50 CFM and the purpose of that is just to ensure that we have that, con that opportunity to exhaust more humidity if we need to. So let's add 50 CFM to that and what do we got? Uh, oh, one on, help me out. 70. Right. Oh, good. That is the design capacity of the unit that we require. We have to have a unit for this particular house that will give us 170 cubic feet per minute of air. Okay, now the system's supposed to be balanced, but you have exhaust capabilities and they have some different numbers down there. Right. In the case of exhaust capability, what we look for in that particular side of the equation is 50 CFM exhaust from each and every bathroom in the building and 100 CFM exhaust from the kitchen. So uh, how do you balance that? Well, what we're looking for in this particular case is an opportunity <coughs> to bring in 
170 CFM mm -hmm. and remove 170 CFM. Although it is possible, should you require additional exhaust capacity, these being code requirements, to have those things only there as a capability. The ventilation system of the better built house will supply fresh air to each room. The ventilation air will need to be ducted directly to the living areas of the building. Stale air will be drawn from those areas of the house where humidity, pollutants and contaminants are produced. The air is then drawn to the outside through a central ducting system. You know, with all the expounding you did back at the office with your equations and the fact the system has to be balanced, I'm a little bit surprised to see a range hood in here. Yeah, I understand that. Let me explain why it's there. The primary reason is to fill the space in the cabinets above the stove. Because when builders buy kitchen cabinets, generally speaking, they get a short one that goes over the stove, and it's really desirable to put a range hood in there. Besides that, most clients want to see them. But there are a couple of different ways that they can be installed. You can either install one that goes right through the wall to the outside and exhausts out of the kitchen, in which case it becomes part of the exhaust capacity of the building. Or alternatively, you can use a recirculating range hood, which doesn't exhaust to the exterior. But in either case, you take that into account. I guess it's a good idea to uh, get rid of bacon grease anyway with a range hood. Sure but is. Uh, let's do something human in here. Let's uh, wash the dog and cook spaghetti. Now, how does the rest of the system take over? Well, the controls take over at that point. And in fact, one, one type of control is actually based on a rise in humidity. This is a humidistat. Now, it's very important to understand that the unit is running continuously at all times. It's always on, but it's on low speed. And all you require the controls for is to boost it up into high speed. One way to do that is to dial in whatever the desired humidity is in the building and have the humidistat kick the unit up whenever there's a rise of humidity. Another alternative would be to use a timer. And that would be in, for example, a bathroom where you wanted to take a shower. You'd be turning the timer on for whatever length of time you wanted. And when the timer had expired, the unit would drop back down into low speed. Okay, but it always runs at low speed, day and night, huh? You bet. It's a pretty subtle system, actually, Oliver. Uh, in other words, what I'm saying is uh, I don't see any signs of the ventilation system in here. Well, if you look up through this drop ceiling, what you'll see up there is a grill cover. And that grill cover is drawing constantly humidity out of this room. And when the unit is kicked up into high speed, we'll withdraw all the humidity from the room and take it out of the building. That cover is over a duct, and that duct drops down into the basement. Um, I would have thought the middle of the ceiling would be a better place. It's preferable to put it on a wall rather than the center of the ceiling, particularly on second floors, because on the second floor, if you put it in the ceiling, you run a real risk of penetrating the air vapor barrier in the ceiling. Usually you'd find it on an interior wall. The ducts can then drop down that wall and into the basement. And if we go down in the basement now, we'll be able to see where the, the duct behind that grill comes out. Okay, to the basement. Whoa, right here. This duct is the one that we were just looking at. That's coming down from the grill that we saw in the kitchen. These other ducts are coming from other areas in the building where there's point loads of humidity, bathrooms. Collected in this header, run into this box, through the box exchanging heat, and runs outside. Great. It all sounds simple. Uh, how does this box actually do that? Well, what we've got here, uh, notice our little uh, illustration, special for you. Does each homeowner get one? Uh, no, but it's very important that homeowners get manuals to go with these things so they know what they've got. We've got stale air coming from the bathrooms and kitchen, as I've said, passing through the core and going outside. Fresh air coming in from outside, again passing through that core and being delivered to the various rooms in the house. Now, you, and you've kept the picture simple for me, but you've written heat transfer there. You might as well have said magic. I mean, come on, what's in the box? What's it look like? The strategy used by the various manufacturers of heat exchange equipment changes a little bit. But in this particular case, and in many other units, what we have is a sheet of poly in there. It's a, it's a material which is polypropylene. It comes like a piece of cardboard. It's a sheet. And there are a number of these sheets spaced apart. We have, if you looked inside each sheet, it's like a bit of corrugated cardboard. So you can actually pass one air stream through the sheets themselves, the other air stream in between the sheets. And because the surface area is so large, it's possible to exchange the heat very easily. Mm -hmm. And uh, picking up on things, these flexible ducts take the shortest route to outside. Uh, how are they terminated? Is that just like a dryer hood? Very similar. But there are a couple of really serious issues to deal with when we put them in. And I'd like to show them to you outside. I think it's easier to see. OK, let's go outside. 
David, there are a couple of issues as regards the location of these hoods on the exterior of the building. You'll appreciate that one of these is drawing air into the building, one is exhausting air from the building. They've got to be at least six feet apart so that there's no cross-contamination between the two. Right, that would make the whole system useless. Short circuits. Right. The other item is that you've got to make sure these things are located at least 18 inches above grade because you don't want them covered with snow. You want to make sure they're always free, grass clippings, that kind of stuff. I guess you'd have to be careful about uh, car exhaust and things. Don't locate them in the driveway and garbage cans. Got to be in a place where it's clean. Is there any particularly uh, special thing about the way you distribute this air into the house? Yeah, there is, actually. There are quite a number of items that we should look at. And I've got a different building where it's very easy to see that. I think we should go there. The fresh intake air in this particular house is being delivered to all the rooms in the building through the existing ductwork for the forced, heat, forced air heating system. What I'd like you to notice is the fact that the incoming air is delivered some distance away from the return air plenum. The reason being that the furnace is operating on two speeds. In low speed, it's consistently delivering fresh air to all the rooms in the house. And when it goes into high speed, we want to ensure that it doesn't affect the balance of the heat exchanger. And that is why these two are not hard ducted together. It's a pretty well thought out system. But in the winter time, you must be delivering some mighty cold air to the house. That's a really good observation, David. Whenever the temperature outside is below freezing, the air coming into the building is going to be unacceptably cool from the point of view of the occupants. There are three strategies that we can use to ameliorate that situation. One is to use an electric preheater in, right in the duct. A second is to use a heat recovery ventilator. And a third is to mix that air with room air prior to the time that it's delivered to the building. Two of those strategies are being employed in this house, the heat recovery ventilator and the mixing. So using those strategies, you can get that air up to an acceptable temperature? Not even. I would strongly recommend that even utilizing one of those strategies, you still deliver that air through high air returns inside the building, high in the wall of the room. How exactly do you do that? There are three acceptable options for delivering cooler air to the living areas of the house. The air can be delivered through ceiling diffusers. Air is directed across the ceiling to mix with the warmer room air before dropping down to the living area. Secondly, the fresh air can be delivered through floor diffusers which direct the air up the surface of the wall. Care must be taken with this system not to allow the air to blow across the room before it mixes with warmer house air. Finally, and preferably, the fresh air can be delivered through high wall registers which direct the air across the ceiling of the room. Well, this has just been a fantastic day. I wonder if you could summarize. Oh, you brought me out here on such a nice day and now you want me to work. Well, okay, the mechanical ventilation system has to be capable of supplying all the fresh air requirements of the house. And while it's doing that, it has to bring fresh air to each and every room of the house. It has to be able to exhaust the humidity and contaminants from the areas that they occur. And speaking of contaminants, you have to be careful with that fresh air intake. You want it located where it can't bring any contaminants in from the outside. Great summary. Next show, we're going to be looking at HRVs and how to install them in the most optimum manner. Huh. I'm interested in looking careful, more carefully at uh, HRVs. So join us next time on R2000, the Better Built House. Hey, wave at the folks.